Before we get started, I thought I'd let you know I've been turning my old episodes into podcasts in case you want to listen to them on the go. There's a link in the description if you're interested. You might have seen my video on 1970s executive cars where I take a look at all the cars that were sold in the UK. If it was a battle royale between the major car companies in the 1970s, it got even more intense in the 1980s. As with the previous video, I've tried to narrow the market down to four-door saloons with a wheelbase over 2.6 meters, but nothing overly expensive. These are the cars I remember from my childhood as this was the sort of car my father was driving. This is the 1980s executive car story. In 1980, the British executive car market was dominated by a car designed and produced in Germany, but maybe not the one you're thinking of. Ford's Granada was a strong seller, now into its second generation. In fact, Ford produced the top three selling cars that year, the Fiesta, the Escort, and of course the Ford Cortina. 10 years earlier, it had been cars from British Leyland that had ruled the roost, but their latest model, the Rover SD1, was selling poorly due to its reputation for build quality. It was sold alongside British Leyland's other large car, the Princess, that had received similar customer excitement on its launch, followed by a realization it was one of the most unreliable cars on the market. Jaguar also came under the British Leyland wing and they were selling the XJ that had launched 12 years earlier. It had received relatively few updates, after all British Leyland's coffers were empty with no money for investment. There was an update in 1979 and Jaguar hoped their main car would keep the company profitable enough for them to develop something more modern. Ford's big rival General Motors owned Vauxhall, but by 1980 their UK design shop had been shuttered and all new cars were designed in Germany by Opel. There were three models on offer, all based on Opel's new record platform, the Carlton, the Viceroy and the top of the range Royale. They replaced models that had been designed in the UK by Vauxhall, and although these new cars had better quality, Vauxhall's image in the 60s and 70s had been damaged by poor build quality, so sales of expensive luxury cars were slow. France offered a variety of cars as well. Renault was still selling the 20 and 30 five-door hatchback that offered V6 power, but their reliability plagued sales in the UK and the few models that were purchased quickly depreciated. Renault were on the back foot and they needed to get their house in order to become successful once again. In the mid-70s, Citroen went bankrupt and was subsumed by Peugeot. They still had the CX, but it had received very few changes and was looking dated. Peugeot had a raft of large cars, the 504 that had appeared in 1968 and was still on sale for budget-conscious motorists. Then there was its replacement, the 505 that launched in 1979. At the start of 1980, it had only been on sale in the UK in right-hand drive form for three months. The larger 604 was by now five years old, and Peugeot pitched it as the ultimate in luxury. It cost more than the BMW 5 Series, but it had been a sales disappointment, only making a profit because it shared so many parts with the smaller 505. It shared a common engine with a Renault 30 that had been developed along with Volvo. American Chrysler had been sold to the Peugeot Citroen partnership, so officially their large car, the Chrysler 180, was also part of their lineup, although it also didn't sell well. Chrysler didn't want their name used, so their cars were rebadged with the Talbot name, an historic badge that had its roots in the Anglo French Clement Talbot car company from 1902. The new Talbot Tagora was presented in 1980 and would go on sale the following year, eventually replacing the Chrysler 180 that soldiered on for a few more years. Like previous Chryslers, it was engineered in France and styled in Britain. Those British designers had intended the Tagora to look more cutting edge, but American managers told them to make something more conventional. The public wasn't impressed and in the first year it sold only a quarter of the expected amount. Italy was also struggling in the executive car market. It didn't help that both France and Italy put heavy taxes on cars over two litres. Fiat had abandoned the market in 1977 when the Fiat 130 ended production. 
Fiat owned Lancia who sold the Gamma and there was also the Alpha 6 that was launched the year before but sales of both cars were woefully low. Scandinavian Saab had launched the 900 in 1978. Sales were buoyant especially when the 900 Turbo appeared. It had luxury, Saab had a history of motorsport success, what wasn't to like? It became a bit of an alternative choice and a Saab badge was gaining some prestige. The same could be said for Saab's neighbour Volvo. They'd been selling the 200 series since 1974, their tough boxy car that as the 260 had been pitched as a luxury saloon using that same V6 that powered the Renault, Peugeot and soon the DeLorean. Japan continued its European invasion with mixed results. It was making inroads into the mass market but no one was buying their large luxury cars. Datsun had updated the 280C in 1979, now with a powerful 2.8 litre six cylinder engine. They also sold the Laurel and in 1980 they launched the fourth generation. This time the car was given what Datsun hoped was a European style to help it sell in this lucrative market. There was adjustable power assisted steering and a quartz digital clock but it still had a manual choke and the dashboard looked cheap. Nissan hadn't yet got the hang of what Europeans wanted from a luxury car. Toyota still offered the 6th generation crown and expanded sales to Germany. It offered similar features to Datsun's models. Both manufacturers were surprisingly keen to show off the mirrors they provided in the glove box in case the passenger wanted to get a good look at their knees. Like Italian and French cars, British customers were still wary of the reliability of cars from Japan but this was already beginning to change. They were certainly warming to German cars, Mercedes were always highly thought of and the W123 continued to be a small but steady seller in the UK if you could afford it and they were looking to expand their range. After all BMW had the 3, 5 and 7 series and were nipping at their heels and the young pretenders Audi had the 80, 100 and 200 that were gaining support. Executive cars in the 1970s sold on the quality of the materials, the spacious cabin and the power of the engine but by 1980 this was changing. Customers were demanding more than leather seats and Axminster carpet. First it was central locking, then a radio cassette with decent audio, then electric windows and cruise control. The BMW 7 series had an onboard computer showing the outside temperature that warned when it approached freezing plus various trip management functions. Of course with the big rivalry between the big German 3 it wouldn't take long to see these features in a Mercedes or an Audi. So that was the lineup in 1980, a raft of choice. In 1981 the BMW 5 series got an update but the big news was Fiat's re-entry into the luxury car market with the Argenta silver in Italian. After getting burnt with the 130 Fiat played it safe by reusing much of the Fiat 132. Many would think it's the same car but the Argenta used all new body panels. It was a little small compared to the competition but it got Fiat at least a seat at the luxury car table. In 1982 BL's unloved princess got a ham-fisted update as the Austin ambassador that didn't provide any more excitement in the car. The Vauxhall Viceroy bowed out along with the aging Chrysler 180 that had already been replaced by the Talbot Tagora two years earlier but Tagora sales hadn't taken off. Peugeot Citroen had four other large cars and it didn't make sense to keep a fifth limping along in production so the Tagora was put out of its misery in 1983. German cars however continued their rise. The Audi 100 and 200 got a significant update with a new highly aerodynamic shape. It wasn't just the shape that made it aerodynamic. The shut lines were tighter and the windows were flush with the body. That gave the car a higher top speed and better fuel economy. Not by a great deal but those small increases helped in the cutthroat car industry. The Audi 200 was still the top of the range and they were pushing ever further into BMW and Mercedes territory with new features the competition didn't initially match like quattro four wheel drive. My father drove the previous generation 200 but Audi prices were rising fast and the new 200 was too expensive so he settled for a new 100. 
Mercedes struck back by moving downrange with the 190, a car that would later become the C-Class. Eight years in development, it was over-engineered, but that meant it was a very safe car. There was the 190 and 190E, E standing for Einspritzung or fuel injection. The public was happy to get a bit of cheaper Mercedes action and the 190 sold well throughout the 1980s. Where the 190 was a car to help Mercedes grow, the new Volvo 700 was the company's make or break car. But in Volvo's time-honored tradition, production of the old model continued for budget-conscious drivers. It had a shape that was a little less aerodynamic than the new Audi 100, but thankfully customers didn't mind. The 700 series would be a success and Volvo flourished. Toyota started selling the second generation Toyota Camry in Europe to go alongside the Crown, but although it was a large car, it didn't have the luxury of its rivals. Toyota was expanding its range in Europe, and so was Datsun, or Nissan as it now called its cars, with an updated 300C in 1983. They updated the Nissan Laurel a year later. As you might expect, the 300C got a new 3.0-litre V6 engine also used in the 300ZX, giving a sub 10 second 0-60 time even with an automatic gearbox. The British model got air conditioning, something not that common at the time. Over at Vauxhall, the Royale got renamed as the Senator to normalise it with a name on the continent. But the big new executive car in 1983 was the Renault 25, replacing the 20 and 30 that would be produced for another year. It was designed by Robert Opron, who'd styled the Citroen SM and CX. Like the Audi 100, it focused on aerodynamics with a similar drag coefficient. The interior was designed by Marcello Gandini, who designed the Fiat X19, Lamborghini Countach, first generation Volkswagen Polo, and the Citroen BX. He sadly died in March 2024. He produced a comfortable interior that set new standards, not just for Renault, but for executive cars with features like voice alerts for problems with the car and steering wheel mounted audio controls. The press praised the car for its ride comfort and handling. It all looked good for Renault, but the car still had reliability issues. When Raymond Levy was appointed Renault's head in the late 1980s, he was given a Renault 25 as a company car, but it almost immediately broke down. So despite high hopes this would pull Renault out of the doldrums, sales of the 25, like the car, stuttered and stalled. The Peugeot 504 ended production in 1983, and a year later, the Austin Ambassador was taken out behind the shed and shot. The Saab 99 and Lancia Gamma also ended production. Both companies had new cars, a Swedish-Italian collaboration that launched as a Saab 9000 and Lancia Thema. It would also appear a year later as the Fiat Chroma. The agreement between the companies was struck six years earlier, so the cars had been a long time in development. The Lancia was offered as a saloon or an estate. The Saab 9000 was also a saloon, but like the Fiat Chroma, was available as a five-door hatchback. The prevailing thinking at the time was hatchbacks were the thing everyone liked, and a large executive hatchback gave refinement, fashionable styling, and practicality. All three cars were very similar, and many parts could be used interchangeably. My father got a Saab 9000 in the 1990s and had more problems with it than any car he'd owned since the Austins he'd owned in the 1960s and early 70s. He was not impressed. Mercedes updated their larger W123 as a W124 in 1984. Like the Audi 100, it had a very low drag and as always it was a luxurious, well-made vehicle and continued to sell well. In 1985, the Fiat Agenta ended production, now that the Chroma was on sale. Peugeot's top-of-the-range 604 also ended production, but without any logical successor. Sales had been anemic, and Peugeot would rather put their resources towards hit cars like the 205 that was flying out of showroom doors. The Citroen CX got a well-needed update. It had been 10 years since its introduction. On the outside, it got plastic bumpers, but it was inside where the main changes were made, with a modernized dashboard. These were relatively small changes though, as Citroen was plowing much of its development resources into a CX replacement. 
In the UK, the Granada was a big seller, so it was important Ford got the third generation car right. Unfortunately, they bet the house on the new jelly mold Sierra styling and hatchback body in the early 1980s. That had proven a big mistake when it launched. The larger Granada followed the same design, and when the Sierra launched, its design was mostly set in stone, so there was only so much that Ford could do. Customers weren't happy with a hatchback, leading Ford to launch a Granada saloon in 1989. Ford had hoped to call the car the Scorpio, but pushback over the Sierra name a couple of years earlier meant Ford played it safe. The car would remain the Granada. Ford's big rival GM released the updated version of the Vauxhall Carlton Opel Omega the following year. The Cavalier had made inroads into Ford's market share after the Sierra mishap. Vauxhall hoped to do the same with their Granada rival that came as a four-door saloon. And under normal circumstances, they would have, but customers were starting to look at BMWs, Mercedes and Audis that seemed to offer a great package with an exclusive badge and great resale values. The all-new BMW 7 Series got an update after nine years with adaptive suspension and dual-zone climate control. It sold well, but wasn't cheap, certainly too rich for my dad, but he managed to score a closeout deal on a previous model. Toyota updated the Camry with less of a Japanese style. It was updated to appeal to American tastes. They focused on improving the build quality, maybe as a result of the extraordinary work the company was doing creating the original Lexus that would launch in Europe in 1990. The Camry might be a well put together car, but there wasn't much luxury to be had, and there certainly weren't many models to choose from. It didn't catch on in Europe, but Americans took it to heart, and 11 years later it would become the number one selling car in the US. On the other end of the spectrum was an updated Jaguar XJ, a car with bags of luxury, but rather lacking in the well put together car department. The new XJ40 had been in development for 14 years. Minimal funds for the government owned company meant the new models kept getting delayed. By 1984, Jaguar returned to public ownership, but it was still being run on a shoestring budget. The new XJ40 was Jaguar's most tested car ever but still had reliability problems at launch. It was also expensive to produce, which left Jaguar vulnerable to exchange rate fluctuations in the large American market. Like the previous XJ, it was a gentleman's club on wheels, a limousine that some just had to have. The XJ wasn't the only new British luxury car in 1986, although Rover had a lot of help designing the 800 from their new partner Honda. It was a joint development with the Japanese car company. Honda got to learn how to make a new large luxury car, and Rover got financing and help getting their quality up to snuff. The Rover 800 launched in 1986 as both a saloon and a hatchback. The press praised the interior, but the suspension and old British Leyland engine were called out for criticism. But unlike previous cars, with Honda's help, it was well put together and the car was a hit. On its launch, customer demand led to short supply. Honda's version didn't use the inferior British Leyland engines and had already launched in 1985 as the legend, but it would take until 1987 until it came to British shores, presumably so it didn't steal the thunder from the Rover 800's launch. Where the Saab 9000, Fiat Chroma and Lancia Thema had been almost carbon copies of each other, the fourth car to be based on the same platform, the 1987 Alfa Romeo 164, was a little different. For a start, it had a beautiful aerodynamic wedge-shaped style by Pininfarina. That Alpha style continued inside, now with a touch of luxury. The extra development time allowed Alpha to use new front suspension for better handling. The hope was this could be a winning formula to topple the established players. The reviewers found it a very rapid car, but they couldn't get comfortable behind the wheel and found it had a bit too much body roll. Then there was the fact that it was front wheel drive. Weren't true performance saloons supposed to be rear wheel drive? But all of this was forgiven. The overall package was a great car and reviewers loved it. Over at Toyota, the crown was discontinued in Europe, presumably because of low sales. Toyota, then Lexus, would always struggle in Europe, but in other parts of the world, their luxury cars became commonplace. 
Vauxhall, well, Opel, updated the Senator. To save money, it used a stretch version of the Vauxhall Carlton Opel Omega platform with more niceties inside like heated front seats, a trip computer, and a CD radio with auto changer. Nothing that competition wasn't already doing, and maybe that was the reason why there wouldn't be a next generation Senator in the 1990s. The German Big Three continued churning out new models. In 1988, there was a new BMW 5 Series with engines all the way from a 1.8 litre to the M5 delivering 335 horsepower. There was also an estate to go with the saloon. BMW sales were booming and they solidified their position in the market with a range of increasingly competent cars. Audi was still playing catch up. They had the 80, the 100 and the 200, but went a step further with the Audi V8. It was based on a stretch version of the Audi 100 platform and looked very similar to the 100 and 200, but 90% of the body parts were all new. The big story was the new V8 engine, that along with the new level of refinement. Audi was catching up with BMW and Mercedes, but it wasn't there yet. In 1989, Nissan stopped selling the Laurel in Europe. It would be replaced by the third generation Maxima in 1990. But the year's new executive cars were all about French car maker Peugeot Citroën. The first car was the long awaited successor to the CX, the new Citroën XM. Under the influence of parent Peugeot, their new car had fewer crazy experimental features focusing on a competent luxury car. Citroën still snuck in their hydropneumatic self-leveling suspension, which gave a smooth floating ride. The company had high hopes for sales, but customer demand fell short of expectations. Thankfully, they were amortizing the years of development on the new car. The Peugeot 604 had ended production in 1985, but the new Peugeot 605 appeared the same year the XM launched using the same platform. It would take until 1990 to arrive in the UK, but like with any other car that wasn't a BMW, Mercedes or an Audi, it received a frosty reception. Customers stuck with cars that had strong resale values and they didn't want to buy a new car only for it to lose half of its value in the first couple of years. The Citroen XM might have been a sales disappointment, but it outsold the even worse selling Peugeot 605. The 1970s British executive car story was a changing of the guard of Rover and Triumph losing their crown largely to Ford and the German Big Three. The 1980s were more of the same, a consolidation of BMW, Mercedes and Audi's hold over the market. Vauxhall Opel started making really good cars, but customers weren't interested in large luxury cars with a mass market badge. Many of these cars in the UK were leased by companies, and if you were given the choice between a Vauxhall Carlton or a BMW 5 Series to show your status both at home and at work, there was no contest. This also affected Ford and their hatchback Granada missteps didn't help. The other story of the 1980s was aerodynamics and quality. In 1980, most of the cars rusted fairly quickly. By the end of the 1980s, Bodies were getting galvanized to extend their life and so improve residuals. Although the 1970s Citroen SM had pioneered a slippery shape to help fuel economy and performance, it was the 1982 Audi 100 that kicked off the gold rush for aerodynamics and by the end of the decade, almost every car manufacturer had adopted these design elements to remain competitive. As for the 1990s, well, that's a story for another day. Don't forget to take a look at the Big Car Podcast, there's a link in the description. I've also done a video on 1970s executive cars, and there's a link on the right in case you've missed it. And when I do a video on 1990s executive cars, I'll put a link to that as well. I've done videos on many of the cars that I've talked about, and there are links to those in the description as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.